Hi, I'm Davier. Finally, I'm back and I can continue making some new videos here in the lab and in the studio. But before any of that, I want to thank you for the almost 900 subscribers. It's amazing. I'm, I'm really speechless. I mean, thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So, I've already shot this video, but the audio was corrupted, so yeah. Then, instead of reshooting everything, I decided to do a voiceover, so yeah. <sighs> so in this video, I wanted to do a quick tour of my latest project that has been going on for almost a year right now, which is pretty amazing. So, the planning, the design and material gathering actually took me quite some time. Two years. So, this is a high vacuum chamber, and I specifically built uh, this chamber to perform some plasma cleaning experiments, because it's a very fascinating subject. And uh, I can actually also use a chamber like this to do many other things uh, that I actually want to try someday. Things like, you know, spattering to create thin film coatings, uh, RF plasma experiments, and why not? I could make myself a good old nuclear fusor, although I would have to do some modifications and get myself some deuterium, which it turns out it's almost impossible to find here. So yeah, it's very versatile, and uh, in this video I want to give you a brief tour of the machine and explain how it works. So let's start by the reason why I built it in the first place. So I've, I've always been fascinated by plasma, the fourth state of matter. Certainly sounds good, uh, but believe it or not, plasma is, at least as we currently know, the most abundant ordinary matter in our universe, which is really cool. It's basically an ionized gas composed by free charged particles and where the overall charge of the ionized gas is neutral. Matter of fact, a um, fundamental characteristic of plasma is its neutrality. So those charged particles floating around are always trying to reach an equilibrium state. And even if you disturb the equilibrium, plasma will try to be neutral. So. Being composed by free electrons and protons is subjected to magnetic fields, electric fields, and it's also conductive. So yeah, plasma, very cool stuff. Uh, it's used every day in a ton of applications. And, but, you know, for now I'm just interested in plasma cleaning. And basically, plasma cleaning is the process in which the actual plasma cleans an object <laughs> either by bombarding it with uh, you know the plasma particles themselves that break down contaminants on the surface or by using gases that react with those contaminants at the molecular level so you know for as an example by using oxygen uh, as the process gas you can very quickly and effectively remove most organic compounds even with uh, high molecular weights, such as, you know, oils, greases, and, and so on, from the surface of the object. Uh, so, obviously, that object must not be something that uh, can be oxidized. Otherwise, it would destroy it. <laughs> we won't find the object anymore. So I began designing a vacuum chamber that could withstand high vacuum levels, which sounds easy, but it's not. <laughs> to achieve that, I needed not just one, but two pumps. And we're going to talk about them a little bit later. So the chamber itself is composed by a stainless steel cylinder that I was lucky enough to find on eBay for cheap, which is not usual. Um, it's quite rare and to find vacuum components on eBay for cheap. That's uh, so you have to be lucky or very patient. That's why it took so long. Uh, so, and this chamber was already fitted with four flange ports. The one on the top and bottom are standard ISO 180 flanges, and 180 is the actual outer diameter. So, ISO flanges are quite cool. They work by compressing an O ring fitted inside a centering frame. 
uh, that is sandwiched <laughs> between the two ports that you want to seal by means of some clamps. Uh, it's just very simple, clean and easy to disassemble. Super cool. On the top part there is a one centimeter thick uh, piece of acrylic uh, used as a viewport. And I know that acrylic is not the best for high vacuum uh, application, but you know, for now it does its job. Uh, and if I want to go higher, it's I I do have a uh, a one centimeter thick um, aluminum plate. So at the side of the chamber, there are two ports uh, fitted with a standard KF or also called NW flange. Uh, those flanges are super cool because they're very easy to disassemble. Uh, there is an no ring uh, on a centering ring again that gets squeezed between the two par the two parts by a simple C clamps uh, C clamp like this. It's very effective and also quite cheap, uh, which is a bonus. <laughs> As a side note, uh, those type of flanges ISO and KF are designed to withstand medium to high vacuum levels, and if there's the necessity to design a higher vacuum chamber that could go, you know, for example, ultra high vacuum levels on the order of, you know, 10 to the minus 11 tors. Oh, well, uh, in that case, even the rubber will be permeable to gas molecules and they even the gas by themselves, they release gas molecules trapped inside the rubber, which is mind blowing. So any kind of rubber won't be suitable for that vacuum level. So there's another, another standard flange, which is called Conflat flange, that instead of rubber, it squeezes a 100% pure oxygen-free copper ring, say that 10 times, uh, between two knife-edged flanges in order to create an almost perfect metal-to-metal -metal seal. It's just amazing uh, you know <laughs> in my case ISO and KF flanges were the perfect choice so on this side we have some valves that connect to the two vacuum pumps and a Pirani vacuum gauge if you are interested in vacuum gauges I made a whole video about them if you are interested so uh, and on the other side we have an electrical high voltage feed through and it's completely homemade amazing uh, so the base plate is a 1.5 centimeter thick piece of aluminium, so it doesn't bend. <laughs> and the hole on the base plate connects to another valve attached to the secondary high vacuum pump on the bottom. So, how to get to a high vacuum? Why so many tubings and wires and what not under there? Uh, wouldn't it be easier just using a single pump instead of that mess? No! That is not easy at all. So it's simple words. A single mechanical pump cannot, for physical reasons, reach high vacuum levels. So you can imagine a gas at atmospheric pressure as a fluid. So when it behaves like a fluid, there is no problemo. The mechanical pump, in my case it's a rotary vane mechanical pump, can get the gas and force it out the chamber, no problems. So, in more technical terms, the gas molecules are all close together, so they can move all together in one direction, and that is called viscous flux. Problems start when the gas is so rarefied that it won't behave like a fluid anymore. So, what to do? At a sufficiently low pressure, you know, gas molecules have enough free space to move in a random and unpredictable way. They just bounce off the chamber walls and from one to another. A traditional mechanical pump is not effective at all to remove them. So this stage is called a molecular flux and to remove those gas molecules you need a second stage pump that uh, in a way has to interact with those molecules. So. To solve that problem, what I have here is a very interesting second stage pump that is called a diffusion pump. What is so peculiar about this pump is that it has absolutely no moving parts. So how the hell it works? I'm a 
that's amazing. It basically works by boiling a very special, and what is special is always very expensive, damn it, type of oil. So it basically boils oil all the time. And oil vapors go up the column and through a series of aluminium conical plates called stages. Those plates eject the oil vapors at an incredible speed uh, towards the bottom of the column. And gas molecules that are floating around get trapped by the oil vapors and get transported with them. So, uh, by the way, in the spiral tubing that you can see on the exterior, inside flows uh, cold water that cools the column allowing the oil vapors inside to recondense and flow to the bottom again and uh, you know so beginning a new cycle the gas molecules transported by the vapors are then expelled through a side port connected to me the mechanical pump that is so ingenious and effective so it really is really cool and this particular model has a maximum flow and not kidding a 110 liters per second at uh, a maximum vacuum level of 10 to the uh, power of 4 10 to the minus 4 sorry 10 to the minus 4 tor quite low pressure that uh, that's really cool uh, on the side there's the chiller and the circulator machine that keeps the diffusion pump cool so that's why all the tubing and the mess that is under here. So on the top, I have some control instruments, such as the uh, Pirani vacuum gauge, a homemade thermometer that senses the diffusion pump boiler's temperature, and a little thermometer controller used as a safety switch. All right, let's see some actions, shall we? So the pumping procedure starts by uh, obviously turning on the mechanical pump. Oh, come on. If it starts. Oh, well. Yeah, well, the roughing pump pulls the initial vacuum. Is the right time to fill up the chiller with mm, some distilled water and a tiny little bit, single droplet of antifungal agent. Perhaps not too much. Oh, well. Anyway, when the ultimate vacuum of the mechanical pump is reached, uh, it's time to turn on the diffusion pump and let it warm up. You can see the thermometer rising up while the vacuum level stays the same. So after a while it suddenly jumps up very fast and it's actually real time what you see here. You can actually hear it boil. So the vacuum level is set to about uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 2 tor by a needle valve that lets uh, some gas in. I could attach whatever gas I want to that valve to have different results with different gases, but today we'll use just plain old air and just for demonstration purposes. Why do I have to get gas into the chamber? <laughs> well, no gas to ionize, no plasma. <laughs> that's that's the rule. So everything is looking fine, so let's get some high voltage into the chamber and see what happens. So I'm feeding 600 volts at about 5 milliamps, and look at that beauty. So in this case, the chamber itself is acting as the cathode, that is grounded obviously, and the little wire mesh inside is the anode. And if you're wondering, the light from plasma is a mixture of wavelengths. And uh, boy, I wish I had a spectral photometer, but it's mostly UV light. And by the way, the glow that you see is due to the relaxation of the electrons at low energy states. And that's, and that's what uh, produce uh, light. They produce a photon, a photon or light. So let's invert the polarity and make the chamber the anode, always granted, obviously, and the wire mesh the cathode. You see that plasma is now concentrated around the cathode. That's pretty cool. And the flashes of light that you see there are very annoying are the contaminants the present on the actual wire that bursts and get vaporized by the plasma itself. And waiting a bit it stabilizes and no more flashes are visible. So as I said at the beginning, plasma is affected by magnetic fields. So here's a magnet and look at its effect on plasma. 
That is very, very cool. You can control it this way. Also, variation in vacuum levels uh, dramatically change uh, the plasma. Alright, so in conclusion, I hope you found interesting this brief look at my project here. So yeah, it, it will see some action in the future, so stay tuned for that. And as always, hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!